Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our second quarter earnings call. We are thrilled to have launched commercial service and look forward to sharing more about that on today's call. Turning to our agenda on slide three, I'll start today's call by highlighting the activity around our space flights during the quarter and then discuss the progress we are making on our Delta class ships before turning the call over to Doug to share insights into our financial performance. Following our prepared remarks, we will open the call for your questions. Turning to slide four, we returned to space in late May with a spectacular Unity 25 space mission. The Unity 25 crew spent four days in training and preparation at Spaceport America before boarding VSS Unity and rocketing to space at nearly three times the speed of sound. The mission was an incredible success. Not only did it validate the efficacy of our astronaut training program, it also affirmed the absolutely stunning experience Virgin Galactic provides. Moving to slide five, on June 29th, we transformed VSS Unity into a suborbital space lab with the launch of our first commercial space mission, Galactic One. The mission brought members of the National Research Council of Italy and the Italian Air Force to space, along with 13 research payloads. Galactic One was an outstanding achievement for our customers as the Italian astronauts and ground-based crew successfully executed all 13 of the research experiments. Feedback from our Italian partners was extremely positive, and the Italian team members received congratulatory notes from across their country, including from Italian Prime Minister Maloney. As highlighted on slide six, our space flight system and flight profile provide researchers with a long list of benefits. Our spaceship cabin is modular and can be adjusted to various needs. Experiments can be structured as autonomous payloads, human-tended research racks, and even as research studies designed to be worn by the crew themselves. Our unique runway takeoff and landing enables research payloads to be loaded immediately prior to flight, minimizing time that experiments spend outside of the lab and providing researchers with expedited access to their data after landing. Our ability to provide unprecedented access to space for researchers, government agencies, and universities means more opportunities for microgravity research and more expansion of human knowledge. Historically, microgravity research has required accepting the very long lead times and extremely high cost of accessing the International Space Station or accepting the limited continuous microgravity duration offered by parabolic flights. We believe our suborbital space lab product hits a sweet spot and we are pleased to offer researchers and scientists access to several minutes of continuous microgravity that will allow for deeper and more frequent study of microgravity's effects on the human body, fluid dynamics, plant food growth, and much more. As we now begin to build out this product vertical, we believe the combination of extended time in microgravity, capability for researchers to accompany their experiments in space, and relatively favorable cost positioning will enable the attraction of both new and repeat research customers. On to slide seven. While Galactic One showcased our research product, Galactic Two is going to set the stage for a new era of suborbital human spaceflight that will dramatically broaden access to space for private individuals. We are just over a week away from the planned launch of this historic flight. The Galactic 2 crew provides a glimpse into the breadth of access that Virgin Galactic will enable as we scale our fleet and expand our business. Their ages range from 18 to 80. They hail from two of the more than 60 countries already represented within our future astronaut community. They have widely diverse reasons for wanting to travel to space, and their journeys will have widely diverse and positive impacts within their respective communities. Along with our pilots and astronaut instructors, they showcase that commercial space is opening the door for opportunities that are within the aspirations of all humans. Similar to Galactic One, we will be live streaming the Galactic Two mission. The live stream footage and widespread media coverage from these flights helps to showcase our product and build awareness of the safety of our systems, as well as the unique and highly differentiated space experience delivered by Virgin Galactic. We might stream that as well. I encourage all of you to join us on August 10th <laughs> for the live stream of this historic mission at we'll virgingalactic.com. We'll be there. As we go forward with flying our customers to space, 
The majority of our webcast will be for private viewing as we focus our efforts on customers and their guests. Turning to slide eight, we are building consumer interest and confidence by operating our commercial space line safely and consistently on a planned monthly cadence. We are executing on that objective. The performance of our spaceflight system over the last two flights has been excellent, and we've been very pleased to see both Spaceship Unity and our mothership, Eve, perform so predictably following their enhancement programs. The enhancement program was successful, and the improved ship performance now enables us to plan our flight dates with reasonable advance notice to our customers. Regular flight cadence gives us a meaningful database of feedback around both the astronaut experience and overall spaceflight performance. Monthly flights also provide valuable maintenance data with which we can continuously improve our operation. Moving to page nine, we continue to progress the development of our Delta-class spaceships, which will drive the revenue growth and profitability of the company as we scale the business. Our production roadmap for the Delta-class remains consistent with what we shared last quarter. With 2023, focused on completing designs for the Delta spaceships, building the required tooling, and beginning fabrication of structural components for the ships. As we move into 2024, we anticipate completing the assembly and equipment installation designs, completing parts fabrication, and initiating the assembly phase at our facility in Phoenix, Arizona, utilizing the sub-assemblies from our suppliers. We continue to operate on a timeline that supports testing in 2025, in advance of the first Delta ship entering commercial service in 2026. Delta ships have been designed to have a relatively low unit production cost and have material improvement in flight cadence relative to our initial ship, VSS Unity. The Delta development process has yielded some excellent enhancements to the ship's architecture, particularly with regard to manufacturability and maintainability, and we are tracking well against our primary ship performance criteria. Before I turn the call over to Doug, I want to convey how incredibly moved our astronauts have been following their flights. Across the board, whether it be research flights or private astronaut missions, Virgin Galactic is delivering an incomparable experience. It is exciting to be flying to space on a regular basis, and we also know that we have many more milestones ahead of us. We continue to make progress on our Delta-class shifts as these vehicles are going to enable us to deliver the same incomparable experience to more customers at a faster rate. And with that, Doug, let's turn the call over to you. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Turning to slide 10 and our financial results for the second quarter. We generated revenue of approximately $2 million driven by a commercial space flight during the quarter and future astronaut membership fees. Operating expenses were $141 million compared to $110 million in the prior year period. The increase is primarily attributable to a $24 million increase in R&D costs tied to engineering work for our future fleet. SG&A increased $7 million. We reported a gap net loss of $134 million compared to $111 million in the prior year period, primarily driven by higher R&D costs. Adjusted EBITDA was negative $116 million in the second quarter, compared to negative $93 million in the prior year period. Free cash flow was in line with our guidance at negative $135 million in the second quarter, compared to negative $91 million in the same period last year. Moving to slide 11, at the end of the second quarter, cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities on the balance sheet totaled $980 million, a sequential increase of $106 million from the first quarter of fiscal 2023. During the quarter, we raised $241 million in gross proceeds as part of our at-the-market or ATM equity offering programs. With the start of commercial service, you will see some changes in the presentation of operating expenses when we report third quarter results in November. Going forward, the customer experience category will be expanded and renamed Spaceline Operations, accounting for costs associated with operating a commercial spaceline. These items include components of Spaceline Technical Operations and Spaceline Missions and Safety, which were previously presented in R&D or SG&A. This recategorization does not change aggregate operating expenses. 
Moving to slide 12 in our financial outlook. With commercial service, we anticipate a monthly flight cadence beginning in August, with two commercial space flights in the third quarter and three commercial space flights in the fourth quarter. Given the flight cadence and manifest details, we forecast revenue to be approximately $1 million in each of the third and the fourth quarters. Our capital expenditures for the third quarter are expected to be between $10 million and $15 million. The growth in CapEx is driven by the construction of the Spaceship Assembly Facility in Phoenix, as well as technology used in the design process for our Delta-class vehicles. We continue to expect our forecasted free cash flow for each of the third and the fourth quarters of 2023 to be in the range of negative 120 to $130 million. With that, I'll hand the call back to Michael for some closing comments. Thanks, Doug. In closing, the second quarter was an important one for us. We celebrated a critical milestone for the company, having safely and successfully launched commercial service with extremely satisfied customers. We are very excited to be just over a week away from our second commercial space flight, with Galactic 2 flying the first of approximately 800 customers with reservations. We look forward to delivering this transformational experience on a recurring basis, and we remain on track to scale the business in the future with the delivery of our Delta class fleet. Finally, before we end the call today, I want to take a moment to address the passing of our good friend, Chair of the Board, Evan Lovell. Evan was a champion for our mission and for the Virgin brand. We continue to keep his family in our thoughts and will forever be grateful for his leadership and his time with us. Our entire board has been incredibly helpful, and Ray Mabus, our lead independent director, has seamlessly stepped in as our interim chair. Ray brings extensive public sector experience to our board, having served as U.S. Secretary of the Navy and as the Governor of Mississippi. With that, we'll turn to questions. Operator, we're ready to begin the Q&A portion of the call. Thank you. If you have a question, please press star 1. If you wish to withdraw your question, you would please press star 1 again. Your first question comes from the line of Greg Conrad with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Hi, Greg. Uh, maybe just to square the, the revenue comments, I mean, you did over $2 million in Q2. You talked about a million in Q3 and Q4 on two and three flights. Um, what's included in that? I would think they'd be a little bit higher just given the, the space flight activity. Yeah, hi, Greg. This is Doug. Um, so in Q2, we had the Italian flight, which was a research flight, so a little higher revenue. Um, going forward for Q3 and Q4, when we look at the manifest details, you know, it depends if it's going to be astronauts or research uh, flights. So depending on what we do uh, with that mix and the manifest in uh, particularly the fourth quarter, uh, we may see higher revenue. So uh, if we look at the the potential here, it's probably going to be closer to $1 million in Q3. And if we do uh, research in the fourth quarter, it would be um, probably over $2 million. And then just on the R&D, you talked about um, the, the restatement in Q3, but R&D stepped down about $25 million sequentially, CapEx up a little bit. Is that Q2 R&D kind of the right level X, the restatement going forward, just given the, the rework and reentry of EVE now being complete? Yeah, so you're going to see some things changing um, on the income statement because the R&D will start to, to move over into spaceline operations. Uh, so things that were historically there will now be in the operations category, which basically represents you know, the cost of operating the space line. So um, you'll see our, our technical operations uh, group go over there, space line missions and safety. This is all the maintenance and ground support and safety and pilots and all of that. So a lot of movement. Um, but in general, what you're still seeing if, without that restatement is R&D is continuing at this level for a while because we're in the, uh, the design phase of the Delta class and you know that effort is continuing for the foreseeable future you know into uh, 2024 so you know without that reclass you'd still see the r d uh, progressing um, at these similar levels thank you 
Your next question comes from the line of Oliver Chen with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi, it's Tom on for Oliver. Uh, just a question on um, how ticket sales are trending, um, especially after the most recent flight, and then how you expect that to trend forward. Um, and then additionally, if you could just remind us on how long um, the lower priced uh, tickets are expected to last relative to the, the price increase. Hey, Tom. Uh, Michael here. So I, I think you may recall, we have, I'm sure you recall, we have uh, around about 800 people in the queue. And with the you know kind of monthly cadence off of our first big ships, uh, even Unity, uh, and until we get the Delta ships going in 26, that turns into generally a four-year backlog, which is a little longer than we prefer. I think a two to three-year back, backlog is the appropriate place for that. So you're going to see us, I'd say, use these early flights to add confidence in our system, to add confidence in the safety of uh, human spaceflight uh, on suborbital journeys, uh, to see, I think you're going to hear excitement, uh, really impressive excitement from the people who fly and as those stories come back. And that combination is purposeful for us because it will build confidence in this new industry, confidence in what this can be, and aspirations and excitement to come. And so we're going to let that build a little while because we have a backlog that's a little longer than we would prefer. And then as we start to get a little closer in towards our Delta ships uh, ready to come online, we will open up in successive tranches of uh, sales. And I think you'll see that from us. That lets us manage the uh, price points at which we release inventory, and we intend, you know, we'll, we will be supply constrained for a little while. So it also helps us manage, uh, and you'll manage the supply as we put that out. So we're going to not have uh, sales outside of what we've talked about before. Uh, we've continued to allow for research sales to uh, play forward, and we have a, a small amount of sales uh, available through the virtuoso travel network. Uh, and you know anybody who kind of wants in will probably go through that channel over the next uh, you know reasonable period of time. And then, like I said, as we get closer to being able to have the Delta fleet scale up, then you'll see us open the door with larger and larger tranches, uh, always keeping a two to three year backlog along the way. Um, the second thing I think you asked was, how do I think about the price points? So of the 800, the first 600 or so of those, uh, the vast majority were in between 200 and $250,000. Uh, ranging from tickets that were sold all the way back, you know, in like 2005, um, up through when the company went public. Uh, we then uh, brought that price point down and opened up a price point of $450,000. And so roughly you've got another 200 seats in $450,000. The research flights we sell, uh, which are fewer in number, and we expect, you know, plus or minus around 10% of our volume of the first thousand, those will be at a on average $600,000 per seat equivalent. So that kind of gives you a, a mix of these early flights. Uh, we have effectively, outside of the virtuoso seats, uh, closed at the $450,000 price point. Uh, when we do reopen up sales, uh, we haven't announced pricing for that, um, but we have sure we don't expect that to be less. Great, that's very helpful. Um, and then a follow-up on, um the research flight demand. Could you just talk a little bit about the drivers of uh, demand for research flights and then what factors lead you to uh, prioritize research flights relative to um, ticketed passengers for tourism? Thanks. Hey, I'll, I'll take the last part first and then go forward. So on the whole, we're going to prioritize uh, the vast majority of our inventory to private astronauts. Uh, I think that's the broad vision that's always been at the founding of this company. And, and kind of core to our, our vision of, of opening space and access to space up for individuals who aspire to do so. Uh, we do believe research is important. We believe research uh, matters uh, to the ongoing growth of human knowledge. We believe that research is a profitable business along the way. We also believe research appropriately adds, I think, a, a halo, a positive halo over the top of commercial spaceflight. 
And so for all those reasons, you know, we've allocated generally 100 of our first 1,000 flights, so about 10%. And I would like to see that kind of be in that range as we, as we grow. Now, what are the factors that are here? Um, you know, mentioned briefly in kind of prepared remarks, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum that are currently available to people who want to do microgravity research. And microgravity research is hugely important as uh, kind of humanity in large uh, tr starts to work to spend more time in space for all the various reasons that are out there. Uh, so there's a lot of research needs to be done. It has either been an experiment that goes to the space station, which is a long time to get in line because there's not that much capacity for that. It's very expensive to get it there, and you kind of have one shot to make it work. And that puts a lot of pressure on those experiments to make them very, very robust. Uh, and you kind of have one, one experiment that lasts a long time. On the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, parabolic flights uh, at the higher end of the current piece, which on average give you about 20 seconds of microgravity. It's not as pristine microgravity as the, the planes can bounce around in the air a little bit. Um, and you can get re repetition on that, but you just don't have enough length of time or sounding rockets are very short um, or drop towers are very, very short. And so what we heard, you know, coming back from our Italian partners on this and from other researchers we've talked to is there's a sweet spot that suborbital space is enabling. And the flexibility that our spaceship provides is we can either keep or remove seats, add payload racks in or not, uh, allow those to be tended by the researchers or actually flown, research experiments flown on the uh, astronauts themselves, hits this middle ground that has just never been available before. And so now we can provide you know, minutes of very clean microgravity uh, time, and that allows not only for a wider range of experiments that could go up, but because our cost price points, uh, especially compared to getting to the space station, are so much less, uh, now researchers can actually plan for a sequence of experiments or repeating experiments with slightly different parameters uh, as they learn more. And usually those are on the way uh, towards either a larger piece that will go to the space station or eventually the moon, or sometimes they are just, they can get everything they need through us. So those are the, the parameters that people need. And then the people who buy those are heavily government and government funded institutions. And so what we're doing now is taking uh, the success of this first flight, putting that into a, a kit that all those researchers and uh, government agencies can use in their own appropriations discussions, uh, U.S. government and other governments across the globe. Your next question comes from the line of Peter Osterland with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. I'm on for much more this afternoon. Appreciate you taking the questions. Um, so first, I just wanted to ask, I uh, appreciate the color you've given on pricing, but uh, just kind of following up on that. In this time frame where you're operating just with Unity, is half a million per flight about what you're expecting on average for civilian flights through 2025? Or are there any considerations related to number of passengers per flight on these first couple flights that are different from what you'd expect on average as you kind of get into 2024, 25? Sure. Um, so when we look at the uh, capacity of, of Unity and the uh, ticket prices that we're um, flying uh, these days, you would expect to see for the near term um, about 600K per flight because there is one seat uh, allocated for an astronaut trainer in the near term. As we move into 2024, um, we expect to open up that fourth seat. And so then you would see uh, four times 200,000 or $800,000 in revenue per flight is what we're projecting. And if we get uh, research seats mixed in there, you would see some uplift from that. Very helpful, thank you. And then uh, as a follow-up, just wanted to ask, um, on your fleet development activities, uh, have you experienced any challenges or surprises that you'd call out either in terms of you know, cost, uh, labor, or design challenges that uh, might be different from what you expected at the beginning of the year? or? Has it mostly just been on track up to this point? No, I haven't seen surprises that are here. Um, you know, aerospace in general is you know, growing and 
competition for engineering roles in certain types of fields uh, remains healthy. Uh, the, the defense industry uh, has more pressure upon it for everything that's going on uh, with the war in Ukraine. And so, you know, we continue to hold our own, I think, against that, and we have an incredible group of engineers that are delivering against this. So that part, um, I would say, is just kind of normal for all aerospace that's going on. And we've had, I think, really pleased relationships uh, with our Delta suppliers here. So, in fact, uh, we've got some of them on site today from both Bell and Carbon, and that's that's been really good. We are working with them um, it's not new technology, but more state of the industry technology of using, uh, we'll use the word digital thread. Uh, you may hear digital twin, but uh, design and uh, uh, software that allows us to go both for the design phase into the parts, the tooling, and manufacturing phase, uh, eventually all the way to maintenance. And so ensuring that all of our uh, teams, whether that's ourselves or our partners, uh, are fast with that software moving through is something that we put a lot of training into, uh, but again, not surprising. So uh, we are keeping great focus on this. Obviously, uh, each time we talk about the Delta shifts, uh, we reiterate this is where uh, the business model uh, depends. This is where we ramp both in cadence uh, and in ability to have a relatively low cost on the variable production unit cost of those ships. And they're super important, so all attention is on it, and we're going to keep it that way. Great. Thanks a lot for taking the questions. Thanks, Peter. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Akers with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question. I wanted to ask um, just your latest thoughts on Imagine, and I think you've described that as kind of option option value that you could activate at some point. You know, now that you've got Unity flying, is that something you could look to, to exercise at this point? So Imagine is, as you said, we've, we've kind of kept it, you know, as an option for us, and it's going to remain as an option for us. Uh, the picture, when, you know, page nine, I think, of the accompanying deck, uh, which was talking about our uh, Delta-class ships, uh, that image is actually an image of Imagine. And we use it because Delta is derived from that base. And there are many things that we've already been able to benefit from in evolving the production model ship from Imagine. Um, the reasons that we put it, you know, kind of off to the side is because the engineers that we have focused on this early design phase for the Delta ships are the same types of engineers that we would have uh, through the testing phase um, of Imagine, a lot of flight sciences, a lot of avionics work, uh, areas like that. And we need those people focused up front on Delta so that we can get the momentum of Delta into the supply chain that we've built. At the time when those key engineers have kind of completed that and we're kind of well down the path towards Delta, uh, the production, the build and production of those Delta ships is pretty quick. And the way in which we are um, not only going to learn through flight test, but we're also building, as you would expect to see in a rapid commercial aerospace development program, we are building, you'll hear the words Ironbird or a static test article. We're building uh, systems that are on the ground that can allow us to very rapidly move through design elements. And, you know, we're wind tunnel testing the Delta ship uh, actually this month. So, a lot of that allows us to have a relatively abbreviated flight test program. And so when you hear us we're doing flight testing in 25 and allowing the first Delta ships into commercial in 26, we're kind of at a point where they're almost outpacing Imagine at that point. So we are going to keep Imagine, right? It's, it's still here with us and uh, we have it uh, secured and ready, uh, but it is likely going to be used in service of the Delta program as opposed to, hey, we're going to turn our attention over to Imagine and get that going. And again, that, that allows us to anchor our technical operations, our flight uh, support and mission control group on one consistent uh, vehicle, which is the Delta ship. And then as we have multiple of those ships, uh, it's the same engineering base, it's the same maintenance manuals, it's the same program. And that will allow for a more efficient operation. Got it. Okay, thanks for the call. I'll, I'll leave it at one. Thanks, Matt. 
Your next question comes from the line of Christine Lewag with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, great. Um, hey, guys. Good afternoon. Hi, Christine. Um, you mentioned the ability to flex cash burn by controlling the timing for next-gen motherships. Can you uh, provide any color to you know your current thinking around the timeline? Yeah, so that strategy that we outlined in the last call is, is still consistent with what we're looking at today. Um, again, because we're pleased with how EVE is performing uh, after the, the enhancement period we're doing, so, or we, we did, so that now we see uh, EVE uh, continuing through the uh, Delta uh, flight test program. So we um, are benefiting from that. So because of that, um, we are still anticipating that we will be working on Delta um, first and getting through some uh, remaining design elements and then uh, moving on you know, to the parts fabrication and rolling off of that over to the next generation mothership program. So it's a lot of the same engineers again. So it allows us to stagger the engineering resources and the focus of the company um, from one program to the next. So um, that would be in uh, you know, the following year. So 2024 is when you'd see the mothership program um, start to pick up um, more heavily as we roll off of the uh, initial phases of the Delta program. So that's that's still consistent with our, what we were planning before. And then just, it's Michael, Christine, just the you know, final continual thought on that is that allows us to bring these uh, additional motherships in at this kind of sequence when we're building the volume of our Delta fleet. So that way, right at about the time that Eve will you know, tap out from a capacity standpoint, uh, we would be bringing on new motherships at that point to manage the scale of the fleet. Great, thanks. And then also, um, after uh, you guys uh, change your pricing structure to the 450000 for the passenger flights, and then you've got $125,000 in a fully refundable deposit, can you discuss any cancellation requests that you've received so far, um, and how sticky has been uh, the orders that you guys have received to date? So we have a limited number of cancellations kind of year over year. The largest was uh, not unexpectedly way back in 2014. And we have not seen an, I'll call it a, a out of line uptick in any of that. Where I get the most questions on that particular topic uh, was following uh, the Titan experience. And hey, did you see uh, any fall off associated with all the media around that? Uh, we did not, in fact. Um, and we've heard from many of our future astronauts, they are uh, very clear, especially those who have been with us a long time, about uh, everything that goes into the safety of this platform. And they were able to talk that through with uh, themselves and others. And so we, we've not seen any dropouts due to that uh, either. You'll see some people drop for, uh, not often, but sometimes it'll be for economics. Uh, sometimes it can be for medical reasons uh, or health reasons. Um, and then that's why you've heard us say we have you know, keep some house seats uh, there and so what we're doing is generally replacing those as, you know, if somebody falls off, we can replace, you know, onesies and twosies uh, back on the way. So hopefully that gives you some uh, color window into those. Yeah, great. Thank you for the color. Uh, thanks, guys. You're welcome. Thanks, Christine. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Leshawk with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to start on the uh, the cash balance that you're at today. And just as we think about some of the optionality that you have with your common stock offerings, what level of cash and marketable securities are you comfortable with? Um, and, and do you expect to maintain that position of around a billion uh, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, we're very pleased with um, the balance sheet right now and, and the strength there and our ability to have access to the capital markets. It's been great. So, um, yeah, we are approximately a billion dollars today, and we like where we are. 
um, this gives us you know the flexibility to invest in these programs that we see are going to generate really high returns and uh, you know gives us a pretty good runway so uh, we like where we are and we fully intend to keep our balance sheet um, strong um, throughout this you know this uh, phase as we uh, move towards the ramp of the Delta class so you know, we don't have a specific um, minimum cash balance um, but we do intend to keep it strong and then following up on the, the Delta class progression, you had mentioned you're on track with the development process, but wanted to ask a bit more specifically, since you previously expected to complete design and tooling um, and then begin parts fab this year, is, is that still the, the near-term expectation in what has been accomplished to date? Yeah, so that is still the expectation. I, you know, tooling will will sequence uh, before parts, and both of those sequence, of course, before the sub-assemblies can be created and then sent over to us. And the way we're rolling that um, a bit in a sequential pattern, we'll have uh, tools completing this year, some parts being built on those tools, uh, tooling probably finishing in early next year, so the, the tools that are needed later in the process uh, come on, and then the parts that are needed later in the process come back in. And all those need to be done because, you know, uh, probably the second half of the year, we will be bringing those into uh, Phoenix for, you know, kind of starting of the final assembly process. So that all kind of remains uh, on track and moving as we expected uh, through there. The Yeah, I think you asked a question, you know, what, what else have we seen in there? You know, one of the things I, I guess I'd share, uh, I set in on, I'll call it an, an executive uh, overview. It wasn't an executive summary. It was a, a deep day uh, on the design process and report out for where we are and some of the major milestones of Delta and how we've uh, used the imagined baseline uh, into this fourth generation spaceship, uh, the Delta class. I was really pleased with what's come forward there. Um, you know, the key things we're trying to do is not create a ship that looks different, and uh, the ship that will we think will perform generally the same as our imagined ship will perform. It's lighter, carry six people, go higher, all those things. What's really been validating is the work that has been done to enable us to turn this ship on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to aspire to even improve there. And the work that has been done to confirm the length of time, I think we put a 500 approximate flights out for useful life, and uh, we feel very good on those numbers as well. And you know, that weekly turn, that uh, length of time in the flights, that's where the, the cost of this on a per-flight basis gets to be really positive compared to other mechanisms of human spaceflight. So it's been the, the detail of that design and showcasing how we're going to carry that through has been very um, uh, confidence building for me. Uh, I, I mentioned briefly just a little bit ago, we are putting the right energy into doing this. These are not going to be one-off ships. So we are developing, you'll hear she's the word, a, a copper bird. Uh, we're actually doing that in our engineering headquarters. Uh, it gets located in uh, this week. And that will have us running through all the avionics and uh, avionic systems, electrical systems, that we can just cycle and cycle and cycle in advance. We'll be building an Ironbird to test out the uh, mechanical systems that go through there and running and running and running and running those. So we're not having to wait until we get into flight test or actual use to understand uh, uh, the margins and the uh, maintenance intervals of our parts. We're going that through all the way through. We'll be building a static test article uh, for our ships and being able to take that to an, you know, kind of an ultimate limit load to uh, confirm uh, all the maintenance intervals that we're putting in. So those things are all very uh, confidence building for me as I watch the diligence with which our engineering and program teams are putting these together. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the from the line of Miles Walton with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Thanks, good evening. Hi, Miles. And Michael, I was hoping you could um, talk a bit about the engagement plan after uh, Galactic 2.0 and, and 
in the frame of reference, I think you mentioned um, these would start to become more private experiences. And I'm just curious, how do you maintain the visibility that's going to be required to, you know, you know, create and sell the experiential side of this while keeping it intimate, private, um, you know, with what basically the customer is paying for? Right. We have to do both, of course. So, um, one, I say we will definitely find uh, a frequent cadence of our flights that we want to kind of do deep showings of. Uh, that's easy around our research flights uh, as we do those uh, pieces, and there's you know, new stories along the way there. And there will be some flights that we will want to do in a full public manner. Uh, as you'd expect, you know, a lot, maybe not all, but a lot of our future astronauts um, are quite excited to tell their own story, but don't necessarily want us to broadcast their personal experience. And so we'll find a balance. I think you'll always hear us talking about when our flights go. There'll always be recaps. There'll always be footage and video pieces out. Um, there doesn't always need to be kind of a detailed streaming of the interior of the cabin uh, for each group of private uh, astronauts that fly. And what I do think you'll see, though, is we'll be giving that material to our astronauts and not all, but I imagine the majority of those will also become very active in bringing those out. So we're going to, I won't even call it finding the balance. This is a both and type of a scenario. We have to first and foremost focus on our customers, deliver the experience that they want, deliver the quality and not um, a kind of overly commercialize their personal experience. They've put a lot of energy and effort and aspiration into this. We have to deliver that. And when we do that right, that is the absolute best marketing we will get because they will become missionary for us. So we're going to get that right. And I think within that, we can also ensure that we uh, are touting what we do and building confidence in the safety, confidence in the power of the experience, and just the general excitement of our company. I think we can do both. So don't want to overplay it now. I'll probably have it just by over answering, but we. I just want to make sure it's like aware. Okay. Hey. It may not showcase like the interior of every cabin flight because it's just not appropriate. Yeah, um, maybe a, a different operational question on the Delta class. At this point, do you have a, a viewpoint of how many would actually be in service in 27? Is it you know one or two, or is it you know, the four to six you're you're thinking about on an annual basis of capacity? Other manufacturing those you know, four to six could be on the line in in 26. Yeah, I think the the end of um, 27 is where you're asking. We'll probably be in between there. You know, as you've heard us say, we're building our factory for four to six shifts a year. Uh, it's logical to start that on the lower side, right? As you start to build build up just muscle memory and uh, kind of work any kinks that are in the system out. So we will probably be uh, less than the full cadence of that, but you know, more than the first couple. We're wanting to get you know a couple out. Uh, right away, because we will be using two ships um, miles in the flight test program, and so those will roll right into service. We'll have probably a little bit of a break uh, between the, those two, uh, uh, but not so far that we kind of mess up the line from the supply chain standpoint, and then we'll start moving again on a pace. Uh, probably, you know, let's get the first four out. I think the other question that will come with that is uh, what's the turn rate of those ships? Uh, as I mentioned just on the question before, feeling uh, very good about our ability to hit a weekly turn from all the analysis we've seen. And we're going to keep pushing on that metric. So nothing else to add today, but that's another one that I think has got some interesting leverage. Okay. And last one um, on the financials. Is this a point where you can kind of confirm you're past the peak cash burn quarterly cadence? Um, I, I guess it's implied for the second half. I just don't know if you're able to say that. Um, you know, we're past this quarterly cadence we saw in the first half into next year as well. Well, we're only giving guidance uh, for Q3 and Q4. And uh, for the following years, you know, we're going to be um, 
making sure that we're able to invest in in the fleet because we see these great returns. So, you know, that involves the Delta class and and the motherships uh, because we see really great um, financial uh, returns from those investments. So we're we're going to be um, leaning into that when possible. Um, But if necessary, you know, we can uh, control that pace and uh, we could slow that spending and uh, keep that um, that level down, uh, but we think uh, the returns are very attractive, and shareholders would be supportive of us uh, really trying to uh, build the fleet um, at, at a rapid rate. So, uh, but we've got flexibility. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Miles.